we can. Yeah. Um, let me just it, give I mean, it one. Let me just give it one more minute till six thirty-five. While I fine. set up my intro, because you know I don't know this by heart. I read it. <laughs> I even typed out my name. My name is Marie Ortiz now. <laughs> Just JD, me. I saw you from afar on Ninth Avenue this past weekend during that, that festival the neighborhood had back going on, which was wonderful. Uh, I saw you too and I ran away. <laughs> I went the opposite way. We have a commonality. <laughs> Speaking of the Ninth Avenue Food Festival, I think I'm cool. I'm wearing my cool shirt today, ah, representing. Nice. Love representing. it. And this is probably from well before COVID. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that wasn't the design they had this weekend, so. No. Mm -hmm. All right, so it is time. Let's get started. So good evening, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit slow to give my co-chair, Joe Restuccia, some time to get here. My name is Marie Ortiz. I'm co-chair of Housing, Health, and Human Services. Uh, this is the May monthly meeting for our committee. We meet the third Thursday of every month. Uh, per the governor's order, we are still meeting remotely, and this meeting is being recorded and live streaming on YouTube, where it will live forever. Uh, the agenda and the materials for tonight's meeting are public. They can be viewed on the, on the CB4 website. If you're not signed up for the eblast, um, I encourage everyone to sign up so that you can see what's coming up in different meetings and see if you're interested in joining. This also links to the documents for the meetings beforehand. If this is going to be your, if this is your first time here, I don't know if anyone is on the phone, but um, there's three things that are really important to remember after the, each presentation. First, the committee is gonna ask questions and they comment, then the public or attendees get the opportunity to speak and ask questions. Um, and in order to speak, you have to raise your hand and the raised hand button on your screen is somewhere on the bottom usually. If you're calling in, it's star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. Think star nine, like raising your hand, the nine. Um, and that's how I remember it. And after the attendees speak, the discussion goes back to committee and on some agenda items, the committee members will vote to write a letter of support or recommendations. Um, let's see, is, if Joe is on, Joe is on. So my co-chair, Joe, if you'd like to introduce yourself, then I guess we can go around the room. Sure, I'm Joe Restuccia, co-chair of Housing and Human Services for Manhattan Community Board 4. Uh, passing it to Betty. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm Betty McIntosh, committee member. Travis. Travis Rogers, public member, Health and Human Services. Jessica. Hi, everyone. Jessica Chait, member. Sabrina. Sabrina and Scooby today. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Oh uh, Pete, Pete. Uh, Pete is Community Board 4. Yeah. Um, JD. Uh, Jean Daniel, um, Committee Member. And then with us also our Assistant District Manager, Nelly. Hi, Nelly Gonzalez, Assistant District Manager, CB4. And we are also joined today by a special guest, Jeffrey. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Jeffrey LeFrancois, um, special guest for the start of the meeting and chair of CB4 tonight. Uh, well, chair and of CB4. CB4, CB4 for more than tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes and, um, I wish it was only for a night. <laughs> uh, Paul. Uh, oh, sorry. We didn't finish. Apologies. Paul. Paul, you're not muted. You can speak. <laughs> While Paul is looking, let's go to. Roberta. Hey, Roberta Barnett, uh, committee member. Paul, just introduce yourself. No, maybe he can't hear us. I don't know. Probably, I think he can hear us. Okay, and then we have uh, for our second presenter three folks in the panel. We're not starting with this item. We'll be up there next uh, from uh, the uh, Clinton Commons HDFC, Park Clinton. Sorry, mm -hmm. McCarry. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can't hear you. Is your sound working? Yeah, if you can just I introduce yourself. So. 
Hi, okay, I'm Carrie okay. Pobans, the president of the board of the Park Clinton, aka Clinton Commons HDFC. Yeah, just want to make sure you talk to make sure we know that your sound works. So when we get there, we can speak to you. Um, Feliz? Hi, I'm Felice Davis. I'm a vice president on the Park Clinton Executive Board. And, hey, hey, and Joe. Hey, Isaac, this way. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> You're on mute. I am Joe Serrano, the president, uh, the treasurer at the Park Clinton. Okay, we've done full introductions for those who are in the panel tonight. We're going to start out with a, so for, I'll put the agenda on the screen for a second. And so, uh, Joe, right before oh, you came on, um, we, uh, Jeffrey and I spoke, and Jeffrey wants to speak about item three before we begin with item one. Okay, sure. Yeah. Just because I have to, I'm supposed to be a, cl I don't have a clone this evening, and I have some paycheck job responsibilities. Um, but you guys, I think it's not a surprise to know that um, housing uh, not only is super important to this community board, um, we've led the way on it for a long time, but I think it's a really, it's also a, a, an issue important to me personally. So I know item three, um, our affordable housing plan has been on the agenda for many months. Um, and the mayor recently announced his um, investment in housing, his plan, his vision for housing in the city. I think a lot of that aligns um, with what we have been doing as a community board um, as it relates to housing and affordable housing in particular for years. Um, at our core, we have been about preservation. Um, without preservation of housing and in particular affordable housing, we wouldn't know our neighborhoods as they exist today in any way, shape or form, um, full stop. It's also why I think we should be talking about the good cause eviction bill tonight, but we're not and that's okay. Um, However, as it relates to our affordable housing plan, we do have some, what I see as pretty significant opportunities. We are both blessed and cursed to have, um, I think we could agree, or I will say it, and whether this agreement or not, Hudson Yards as a part of our district. Um, it was a hard fought, challenging time for our community that brought us um, to zoning agreements and resolutions that we are still dealing with and hammering out today. But there is a zoning district around the, what we think of as the Hudson Yards area. Um, and I really want to encourage folks to think um, beyond what exists there that's allowed today. Um, you know, we've, you've heard us talk about residential FAR. Earlier this year, the governor put forth a plan to lift the cap on residential FAR. This committee had a really important discussion about it. Our land use committees had important discussions about it. And I hope that the discussion continues tonight. And I want you to think about the fact that we have an opportunity to figure out how we could bring the next Penn South, the next Manhattan Plaza, the next Mitchell Lama program um, to an area within Hudson Yards if we're willing to accept higher residential developments. And right now we allow, you know, a hundred plus stories of commercial developments. So why should we hamstring ourselves to the fact that we can't do that for residential? And so tonight as you talk through the affordable housing plan, which addresses all of community district four, I, I hope you'll think about Hudson Yards specifically as an area that we can signal to the city and to the state that we want to see a new type of housing investment in this area that we have not seen in decades. And maybe that's not the resolution of the community, of, of the committee, um, but I really think it's worth our time and our discussion because it gets back to right what I started with. Um, housing, the importance of affordable housing, the importance of, of diversity in income and the housing that we create. Um, and you know, I've learned from a lot from Joe, a lot from JD, a lot from folks on this community board. Um, and so I hope we can just continue that dialogue and conversation in the spirit that we always have of, of really thinking about how we wanna continue um, to make sure that people have a place to live, to call CB4, um, Chelsea Hell's Kitchen and Hudson Yards um, home in their district. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And also, I'm assuming you meant higher density on residential, necessarily higher buildings. That's density. You know, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's the housing committee. I like the nuance of, of land use versus housing. Yes, density right. isn't always translated to height. Um, so thinking about density of units and how we can bring that to life um, in Hudson Yards um, in our neighborhood. So I apologize for jumping the line tonight and talking on item three. I appreciate the co-chairs for allowing me to, to join and sort of just share some initial thoughts and look forward to, to hearing from Joe and Maria um, 
what you guys talk about. So you twisted my arm. <laughs> <laughs> so let us go to our first item then, which, which thanks is everybody. A lot of, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, We've allotted 10 minutes for, first let me just put the agenda on the screen so we can see it. Why is the agenda not showing for me now? Of course it's not showing. Well, the first item is a letter to housing works right. regarding a syringe disposal kiosk. And uh, I have that, I, I can put that up. Yeah, it's old business. Uh, the reason we're starting with it tonight is because it's gonna be short. The bulk of our meeting tonight is gonna be item three, which is what Jeffrey just spoke about, the affordable housing plan. Um, Joe, you put up the uh, the latest draft that I yes. edited. Okay. Um, so basically we held off on doing this um, due to other priorities. Uh, we had this meeting. It's not time sens sensitive, this letter. Um, we did this meeting. Originally, we talked about this item, I should say, back in January. Um, Housing Works came to committee to request the Sharps disposal. I keep saying disposable, but disposal kiosk mm -hmm. um, be installed on Dyer, uh, which is on between 9th and 10th, between 34th and 36th, if you're not sure where Dyer is. Um, the committee and public members voiced concerns about the kiosk bringing people who are drug users, um, that it's not the right time, and basically it's an ineffective solution. Um, it went to full board. Full board voted to send the letter back to committee to make it more clear and representative of what was discussed at the committee. Right before this meeting tonight, I edited this a few days ago, and um, actually tonight before this meeting, I listened to um, our discussion of this item, just to be clear, and um, the notes that I had and I from that meeting, which was pretty accurate, actually, was that Dolores said, and I uh, clarified, Dolores, what were the main points for the letter? It was to thank Housing Works for the presentation, uh, that they were open to hearing other solutions. We support their initiatives to partner with organizations with more expertise for safe disposal and to reject the kiosk at that location or other locations in CB4 at this time. So I just edited the letter. I made it a little shorter. Um, I basically, and I rephrased it. So up front really would be, we're voting to reject, not voting to think, right? The original letter said voting to think. Uh, we, we're voting to reject the kiosk at this location at this time. I included more briefly um, than the original letter the efforts Housing Works are, is already doing regarding Sharps, um, their openness to solutions. And finally, the letter just thanks Housing Works for their willingness to partner with other organizations and thanks for their support and current efforts in the community. Uh, I like short and sweet, so it's three paragraphs. Um, does anybody have questions, comments, concerns, or motions related to the letter? Just one, one, one bit of housekeeping, and that is Leslie Williams, a chance to introduce himself. And I think I missed Roberta. Is that correct? Uh, that's no, okay. Yeah. Leslie okay. Williams, member of committee. There you go. Okay. Maria, Maria, I think you did a great job. I think this really uh, summarizes what we discussed and what the sentiment was mm -hmm. in a very simple way and direct way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I can't see if anybody else, Joe. Betty. Does, if, thanks. Betty has a hand up. I, I like short and sweet. Thank you for doing that. I just wondered if there made any sense to clarify that we are not interested in having these uh, kiosks outside, but I mean, I guess it's, it doesn't really matter because people, organizations can have these inside their buildings. Yes, they and then can. That's their business, right. right? Okay, so it's fine then. I just wanted to raise that. Uh, Roberta? I do not in any way mean to beat a dead horse. And if it's ultimately a matter of disagreement, I'm uh, quite respectful of that. Um, a point, my only point of contention with this letter is um, it's moved to reject rather than simply not support. I know that that is, you're like, that is a matter of semantics. What's the difference? I think that reject is incredibly strong um I, it doesn't where is the word, Roberto, where in the, is the word in the, uh, line nine so that would be in the, she first, means the first paragraph yeah the first paragraph and mm -hmm. there's other points in the letter where you know we say uh maria i think you wrote so let's start with wait let's start with the first thing rejecting the kiosk so um, why don't we just say not support we could say not support i just 
I mean, because we're going to vote yeah, I, again. I think, this is a new vote, yeah. but back in January, that's what we actually said. So I wanted to reflect what was actually said in the meeting. But I think that's a fine amendment. I'm going to say not to support. Better? I'm going to write that. Yeah. Really fine. Well, I, I can actually do it in the document, Maria, and I can, I can send it to you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I have the I'm document typing too. And okay. I have the document live. You've got an extra T and 35th online. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> so feel free to. Thank you. Okay, Joe's fixing that. Okay, Rebe Roberta, what else were you going to mention? What's next? Uh, no, that that is my primary edit. Thank you for um, accepting the amendment. Okay, uh, cool. JD is next. Uh, I want to second Leslie's uh, approval of this letter and move that it be adopted. Any other any other any other comments though from anybody? In this case, no. Oh yeah, yeah. Paul. Oh, okay. Paul, yes, Paul. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I may have seen one before, but I, I I missed the description of what the kiosk actually looks like. Is it like a garbage can? Is it like a hot dog yeah, stand? Yeah, it's 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 a it's sort of like like a recycling can for sharks. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So JD has moved. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Second, Betty. All those in favor, please raise your hand. It's easier. Okay. Passes okay. unanimously. Right. So we just. Oh wait, Ryan Weber has his hand up. I know, but we we already voted. So you just want to move, okay? Yeah. We, we, <laughs> if we had a lot of back and forth, Sorry. I would say. Sorry, whoever Mr. Weber is, apologies. Um. So yeah. <laughs> we love you, Ryan. We love you. <laughs> I want to set, set the stage for our next two items. One is it's a presentation by an affordable housing HDFC with, for moderate middle income individuals that was built on Clinton Irving Noble site on West 52nd Street between 10th and 11th Avenues as part of the ongoing redevelopment of the Clinton Urban Renewal Site. And this group is coming to us tonight with some serious issues about the building uh, condition and what's happened that they are now having to inherit from the sponsor. So that's the broad question. Just to remind everybody, we did a rezoning for this back, I believe in 2013. It was specifically the rezoned from the manufacturing zone to residential for this project to be built. This project was the three component, the three components, they moved at different times. The first was what was known as the Clinton Commons HDFs Clinton Commons project, which became the Park Clinton. And then the uh, site seven buildings on West 53rd and West 52nd streets, one by Taconic and the other one by CHDC. And you'll understand as I give the presentation why that is, is key to understand all these in relation to each other. Um, our last item will be the affordable housing plan, which is the guts of our meeting. So I'm gonna turn over a presentation to Carrie Pobans, who is the president of the HDFC. But first, if you can just, for a subject presentation, just tell us a little bit about the units, the people, the so we understand the flavor of the building, and then we'll talk about the, the issue at hand. Carrie. Hi, and first I, I wanna thank the community board for meeting with us, but also for helping to create this building that, that we had the privilege of living, living in. And uh, as we say, we won the lottery. Uh, we all feel like we were very lucky uh, winners in this process and, and we're very appreciative. Um, so we are an income and resale restricted cooperative um, on West 52nd Street. We have 95 uh, apartments and all of our shareholders were um, chosen by lottery. And the cooperative was in existence for less than one year when all this began. So, you know, we, we really came together as a community. We're a random selection from, from all over the city. Um, and not many people have moved out. You know, it's, it's now been, what, eight years since our existence. And then we're a strong community. And this has actually been a central issue now for, for seven years. So um, I'm really happy that we can meet and discuss about Eric, can you just tell us a little bit like the income ranges so we understand? The sure. So it's 80% um, to 165% um, AMI um, and it was split between the 95 apartments. So that means there's a broad range. It's what the community board and the community has always requested for the moderate middle income and people of all different uh, income ranges live in the same building, owning the same type of units. One at 80% may have sold for less than one at 165%. It was all figured out and we're very happy that First of all, that you got in here, you established yourselves, and now I'll put up the presentation and you can talk about the issue at hand, okay? And, and just remember to tell me when to move ahead, okay? Okay. Can everybody see the presentation? 
All right, so I already gave a little bit of an introduction. So this is a, a photo that I took of the building last week. So you can see that we're surrounded by scaffolding um, and these are the conditions I'll explain. So what we're really requesting today is, is two things. One is to help ensure that Taconic Partners, our, our next door neighbor at 525 West 52nd Street, finishes outstanding repairs that were caused by their construction. Um, and this has been going on since 2015. So it's a longstanding issue. And to be clear, our building has taken on ex legal and engineering expenses to help and cure these issues. Um, and as an affordable housing cooperative, you know, it's, it's not easy. Um, and second is to help get a formal response from HPD and a project manager assigned to our multiple requests for a loan um, under the multiple family uh, housing rehabilitation loan program. Um, we have had communications with HPD, but we just have not had a formal project manager assigned. Hi, next slide. Actually not, this is a, this is a Okay, oh, it's a PDF, yeah. It's a PDF, um, right? I did a little differently, right? <laughs> so this is um, what our building looked like just before I moved in in August 2014. Um, it was a, a bit of a timeline between the beginning of 2014 to August when we all moved in. And um, these photos are from Google, just to, to be fair. Um, they're all time stamped. So this is the front of the building on the left side. And um, on the right, that's the, the back of the building from 53rd Street. And as you can see next to us is a, I believe it's a, it was a city owned building at 525 West 52nd. And behind that us- was, uh, that, that, that was privately owned. Privately owned, okay. Uh, and then next uh, behind us is an empty lot. And one year later from when I moved in, this is what it looks like. So next to us, we have no building anymore. It's a, a big hole. And then from the back, you can see that the, the construction that began wrapped our building. So um, the empty lot is now a hole and the building is gone. And on the next slide or the next page uh, is a zoom of, of the Google image that I just showed. So you can see just, just how deep this construction went. Um, there was a lot of blasting. Um, the bedrock around that art the building is built on was, was blown up all around us. Uh, so during this process, and, and I will say that it was a surprise this construction was even coming to the shareholders, it was not disclosed to us. Um, and the fact that it happened in less than a year was was quite a shock to all of these new um, this new homeowners. Not so di not disclosed by the sponsor who developed the building. Yes. And also, also, I will say, I think because of the timeline of when we all purchased, it was not, maybe it was in some discussions, but it wasn't on the public record for people's attorneys who are doing searches. And it, it was not known. This is something that we've talked about for many years. It was not known. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can see here the street level. I put a, a line there to just show you how deep this, this construction went. Um, and that, that section there I mentioned, building cracks and leaks into apartments. So the first floor is severely impacted with multiple leaks into their apartment, their brand new apartment. And um, this one section here I, that I show in the middle is a section that where Taconic actually dug under the retaining wall of our backyard and it caused- Right here, right here, yeah, right? It caused soil to pour out of the Park Clinton and, and actually there was an emergency underpinning to correct the situation. Um, and, and Taconic did respond immediately um, and, and tried to correct that. Unfortunately, though, that caused a condition that revealed itself years later, which is that um, it created soil settlement and drainage issues in our backyard, um, which is something that we're still working on. So this is just an example of some of our lingering issues, and some of them are minor. Um, the upper left-hand side is a picture of a decorative brick that has been on the list since 2017 to be um, replaced. It's a painful reminder, actually, because you can see it every day. It's on 52nd Street. Um, it's been in discussion since 2017 to, for them to find a matching brick. Now, I think they pr pr proposed a brick that did not match. Um, and this again, this building was less than one year old when this happened. So. Um, Another impact that's been longstanding is our plants died um, in the process of this construction because they were covered by scaffolding. Um, other plants died because of the, the changes in the light condition in the backyard. And you can see that we're actually kind of surrounded um, pretty high. The, the, the buildings behind us actually have second floors that go up right to our property. So our, our, uh, our backyard's a bit of a canyon. Um, and then the other two issues are fairly recent. So on the far left, you can see that there's a drain um, and that was something that Taconic pl uh, placed in there in, in accordance with our engineers because of the condition that was caused by that soil that poured out. Um, it, it created all sorts of sinkage and drainage issues and we found a broken drain in that process. And then on the far right is um, 
a, a troubling one because in this process, we actually had to take apart, or Taconic rather, took apart a terrace and had to take down this fence and put it back together. And unfortunately, there were permit issues from the construction company that they used, and then this wood sat for a bit. And what happened was they put back wood that was rotten, um, and then they later power washed the wood, which caused it to warp and, and actually now buckle in areas. So and, this- And, and, uh, and just, just for the committee, you can see that that fence runs along this line and describes private terraces for some of the ground floor apartments, correct? Uh, well, there, there are common spaces that are, yes, the access is private, but but owned by but the, the cooperative. Yeah, but the, com the fence is a common element of the co-op, but they are, they took down the fence of somebody's outdoor space, and that's, that's, that's part of this. Yes, and, um, you know, this, this happened last year when there was a shortage of wood, and we got a quote that was outrageous for the cedar, and we could... You know, anyway, that, that's what, kind of why it stalled, because of the, the price of wood at the time. Um, and... You know, I think I'm highlighting this because we just need help in these discussions because we cannot pay a lawyer to do this and it's been complicated. Next. And the next is the next request we have is support for um, contacting HPD and, and getting a project manager assigned to our case. So um, we had our first local law inspection and it revealed a project that was estimated to cost $600,000. Now, this is a building that was uh, five years old and brand new. Um, so we put this, our sponsor on notice because our shareholders and our board feel that is what we should be doing considering it's a brand new building. So we, we tried to tackle that project and we, we got it started. Um, and in the process, it was revealed that, that there were more issues, um, the scope has changed significantly. Um, and we've applied to um, this, this loan program at HPD, which is meant to, to help uh, HCFCs with these kinds of issues. So we applied first in September, 2021, and we were told that they're full and apply again in January. We applied in January um, and have not got any response beyond we're backlogged. Unfortunately, the conditions are just very pressing as we're doing, doing this work um, and it's, 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 it's a safety issue. And we need to at least get somebody on this because it's no longer just a, a regular local law project. It's gotten more complicated. And as a limited equity cooperative, you know, we depend on HPD for this kind of financing support. We just can't go to a bank and ask for a loan. We can't refinance our, our mortgage um, that is restricted. And it's, it's, it's a very complicated issue that we need support on. And at least a project manager to have these discussions with so that we can maintain yeah. the health and safety of the building. And I just want to note that this is called Local Law 11, which is a cycle every five years that happens in various neighborhoods. Our neighbor, our part of this part of the neighborhood is subject to that right now. And in fact, unless this building shows they have a plan in place to proceed, they will incur fines for not complying and doing the Local Law 11 work. So it's not as if it's sort of an option that can make people can get to. It really does have a time deadline on it. And I will say that we already had paid a fine um, for this just and it, it's quite a shock for the board that we had to deal with this um, so soon into that, you know, the, the construction of our building. So let me just go back for a moment and let's talk about the items with Taconic first. So Maria, I'll put this down. So Maria and I met uh, with McCarry and one of her board members a couple of weeks ago. Yesterday, Maria and I actually went to the building to do a site inspection to understand better. We can speak about this tonight. And uh, Jesse contacted Taconic Partners and we had a meeting with them. And we really tried to pull together, what are the issues, what is it, what could be done? I think the board can be very helpful. We should, we should we propose to write to Taconic tonight and then get a clear direct list as to the things that can be done. And in our conversations with the board, we suggested that it would be better if Taconic, they come to an agreement and Taconic just actually gives them the funds so they themselves can do the work because the back and forth with Taconic as a large development organization is very difficult and it costs money for them on their, their various professionals. That's, that's ridiculous. They should just make an agreement, settle and be done and get, and they, they do get their work and get it done. They can get it done probably cheaper too. The other thing though is HPD. And this is an ongoing issue. We, we've had the board have with HPD that it is horribly understaffed. Um, it is literally from my engaging with this about they, they have at least like 30% or 40% open positions. So that's creating a huge problem across the agency. However, when you have emergencies like this, they, we have to assist an HDFC here because 
The reason they're affordable is because they're on urban renewal land. We put this all together. Now they're managing it themselves and they need assistance just because we have put it together doesn't mean that we as a community go away. We have to be behind them to make sure they get the financing they need so this building remains affordable. And I think that's where we can work as a board and a council member writing to HPD to actually get a project manager assigned to this. It's not gonna, I think the carries, it's not gonna happen in a day, but at least if there's someone assigned, you get in a pipeline, you start to move through a process. So McCary, have I sort of laid this out? Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, questions from the membership for, oh, I'm sorry. Does, does a, a Joe or a Felice want to speak at all? Yeah, I just want to second it. I, uh, we, 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 I was on the, I've been, I was on the very first board and even I think before we had our official first board meeting, you know, these issues just started, started coming up. And as McCary said, it was a, a big surprise to us. We had worked with the Conic at the beginning to do the licensing agreement, which was a, a bit of a struggle. Um, and we, we got there and, and we thought we were good. And then, you know, subsequent boards, it just keeps dragging and dragging and dragging. And, and our building is covered in, in scaffolding and we're, we're dealing with a variety of things on multiple fronts from the board. So, you know, really appreciate uh, the help and, and thank you for coming to the, the building, Joe, and, and really kind of understanding like what, what we're facing and, you know, the, the, the fact that it is affordable housing, anytime we, you know, we now as a treasurer, we've had to have our, our largest increase um, in, in, in dues in our HOA fees. And, and that's just to try to keep up with the items that we're, we're, that we're trying to pay for, we're, you know, we're having difficulty getting just a, even a bridge loan. Um, so those are the, the items and, and, you know, and, and it's a hardship on a lot of the folks in, in the building as we, we, you know, been increasing the, the maintenance the last couple of years. And again, we had our, our largest one this year. So uh, a lot of not happy folks in, in our building. And we just, you know, our focus right now is the, the safety and kind of the financial health of the building. So, you know, I really do appreciate the help. Felice, anything you want to add? Hi, I think the guys covered everything and we really, really appreciate you taking the time to support us, to come visit us yesterday, to see in person, you know, the, the issues that we're having. And yes, it, it's very frustrating and <clears throat> our primary concerns are the safety of the people that live here and, you know, keeping our affordable housing units safe and affordable. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let's go to Paul, then Roberta. Oh, sorry, sorry, JD was first, and then Paul. Thanks, Joe. Uh, question for Joe and Maria, was Taconic or HPD invited to this meeting tonight? We did let them know that we didn't, we didn't speak to HPD because we feel we have to sort of pull together information first, but Taconic, we did let them know the meeting was happening tonight, and they were, in, in the meeting that we had with them, they were, at least to us, very willing to come to some kind of agreement to close this out. And that gave us a lot really, of, you know. Willing to come to an agreement? Is that what yes, you said? yes, yes. Um, McCary, this sounds like a dreadful situation to me. Has Taconic been responsive uh, to the, what you're going through? I mean, we've had back, you? we've had back and forth with them over the years, right? But it's, we have to fight for every little thing. And I think the biggest thing that I'll say is the building was new, right? So. All these conditions that are aging it. Um, our building is new. They've been reluctant to address the issues to your satisfaction. Is that correct? Yes. And not everything and has been. Right. And HPD, have, have they been responsive to you? Not formally. I mean, uh, we, we've had some some conversations, and you know, I feel for them. They're understaffed, but. Uh, we can't get yeah, financing. But, so. but they're a city agency and they need to act, they need to function no matter what. Thank you, McCarry. Uh Paul and then Roberta. Yeah, uh, Joe, I was just wondering you, you would be more likely to know than I. I don't know the name Taconic. Do we do we have do they have a track record in our neighborhood at all? Paul, you're having amnesia. Taconic built a large building on 52nd and 53rd Streets. They came to the land use committee for the new building on 43rd Streets. They built a number on 43rd between 8th and 9th. They, they, they did the Google building down in Chelsea. They're a very well-known, very large developer. And one of the things that just struck me here was, it's not uncommon for there to be damage to an adjacent structure during construction. That happens all the time. But normally, the, 
that Jason developers really try to engage with, they get it done. They don't want it hanging out. I think one of the problems here, as McCarry explained, the board, your board changed, right, McCarry, over the period of time? Yes. And, you know, I think also we just never got a chance to even organize as a building, as, as Joe mentioned, he's our founding president. Uh, this was thrown at us before we even became a cooperative. You know, we weren't a community yet. This, this has actually been the central issue since our founding. So. Like it all, a lot of complicated things happen very quickly in the early years of their ownership. That's a hard thing to manage. You normally don't, Paul, in the initial years of ownership, have to deal with such amount of construction and issues around your building. You maybe have to figure out how to get to know each other and how to manage a super and a manager. That's what you normally do. This is a lot well, bigger than normal. Joe, the point of my question is, and now that you've refreshed my memory, thank you. <laughs> I guess I have heard of them. How you yes. avoid these? But no, just, you know, in, in empathy to the folks in that building, you should know this is just the latest iteration of a very familiar song. I know it personally in our building's experience. Uh, construction in New York City very often proceeds on one, uh, one by, by one rule alone. They ask for forgiveness and not permission. I'm surprised, Joe. What I'm talking about is when I look at that picture, I can't believe that anyone who ever built anything would undermine a retaining wall. And yet my neighbor right over here behind my right shoulder punched a hole through our party wall to get his goddamn eye beams in without asking us. Uh, well, nobody died on his non-union construction, so nobody can afford to go to court unless somebody died. You know, anyway, I empathize for you. And I hope we can do whatever we can do to get these guys into a room. They should worry about a story like this. Isn't that that that's a scary picture that retaining wall stuff. That's all. Roberta, you're next. Thank you, um, and thank you for uh, this presentation. Uh, I guess my question: is This may be for a Joe slash Maria, but I'm trying to understand the um, local law um, and facade inspection violation here. Is there a responsible party? Is this an issue with the original architect or? No, no, the, uh, local law 11, it, it doesn't matter. There's a cycle and whoever owns the building at that point in time, in this case, the co-op is responsible for responding to the local law. There's an underlying issue that McCarry I'm going to, just going to note because they're handling separately. It is very unusual that a building that is eight years old would have this degree of local 11 violations. It has been explained to us that a lot of the parapet has to be replaced was not constructed properly. So they have a separate issue in their dealing with, with responsibility of the developer sponsor for some construction defects. Irrespective, they are the owners today. They have to do the repairs. They have to manage it. And they don't have the funds to do it. So we need to help them in the meantime, get the proper resources so they can take care of this. And then separately, they'll be seeking to recover, engage, negotiate with the developer. Okay. Is that, yeah, is that, that, is that a fair um, representation, McCarry? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna mm -hmm. ask the developer. Yeah, yeah, we, we really asked them to focus on the things that we could make a difference with. Okay, perfect, thank you. Leslie? You know, question, um, has this resulted, hopefully not, in defaults at this point? Are you experiencing any of that with the uh, owners? No, we aren't, um, but we have scaffolding up. And as I mentioned, our scope of the project has changed and that scaffolding is, is gonna be up um, for a long time. And, and that's a cost that we did not budget for. Um, so we are, in the long term, we are, in need of a loan, um, and that's why we mm -hmm. want to bring this to attention of HPD. The, um, um, the the owners cannot remove the scaffolding until the local law 11 work is done to the satisfaction of the Department of Buildings. And if they cannot get the financing, even when they start, they have to have 5 million inspections before that could be signed off on. Other members of the committee, uh, Travis, Pete, Jessica, questions? Uh, uh, Betty? Katie, questions? Well, I, my, I guess my question is, is there a precedent for um, there being the ability to expedite? I mean, just the case of the increased cost of scaffolding as, it, as if you haven't even had the opportunity to fully, without a project manager, it sounds like you can't fully remedy the situation. So you're incurring costs because of the city's inability and given given the significance of this project being affordable housing, I don't know, is there just like any kind of 
precedent or policy that could be that we could encourage that would allow for buildings like this to get priority? Uh, I could just say to you, Clinton Housing has a 134 unit, seven building project that's been delayed for two and a half years because of a lack of a project manager. And they keep on changing. I mean, that is how HBD has really had difficulty in getting adequate staff. I see Roberta saying, like shaking your head. Right. This is a real, a real serious matter. And DOB does not care. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I just wonder if there's like a potential, like, is that legislation that should be introduced or, I mean, not just obviously for, for our district, just in general, that these are buildings that need to be preserved. These are, you know, potentially more vulnerable populations that need, we need to ensure housing is provided for and they're in precarious situations, as McCary said, without being able to afford lawyers, et cetera. Um, that, I don't know, maybe there's like a budget request that's uh, I'm know, I, I think this is, more this. Of a, this is more of a policy and political request because we need our council member to advocate on behalf of this yeah, HDFC. Of that's, that's really where I think our, our, our role lies here because okay. it's just, we're not going to clear, DOB has a serious set of requirements because of public safety, right? And they don't care how you get your requirements done, even though it's affordable housing. Go to Betty and then JD. Yeah, I, I just was thinking, at a certain point, some kind of more activism that gets in the news for this kind of thing, that's just my one thought. First, I thought a lawsuit, but obviously the, the housing doesn't have that kind of money. But I mean, at, maybe after trying our political uh, people, if that doesn't work or if they could join in you know, I, I could see this being a big fuss out in the public and it might, Taconic might not want to be embarrassed by that. I don't, kind I, I don't think Taconic is the issue. I think that, that's, that's much more resolvable. It's HPD and getting the resources to the building. I think Taconic, the board can help with because Taconic mm -hmm. comes to the board for various public approvals, right? So. All right, I guess that got a hook on that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't feel ashamed on asking or to get something settled. But uh, JD, followed by Roberta. Yeah, Betty always wants to take to the street and do big demonstrations. I want to suggest something a little more modest if possible. Uh, this is very concerning because we are losing affordable housing through neglect, through demolition, and now through this. So I'm going to propose to Joe and Maria to think about, and the committee, to think about hey hate these little meetings we're having all the time as Joe knows, but to set up a meeting with HPD. Yeah, yeah, and, I know. And those folks and, and Eric and just start having these meetings and let's say let's let's try to move the ball forward. So I'm gonna throw that out there to Joe and Maria and and the folks who are bringing this to us. Uh, Roberta I wanted to inquire specifically about the DOB fines and if there are um, options to get either delay or a temporary waiver for those. I know that that does not solve the problem, but it does seem like a solvable, fixable intervention, especially given where government staffing is right now. Um, I don't know if we've reached out to DOB with that inquiry, but I think it might be an appropriate thing to you, add. Um, as, a, as an owner, you have to file plans, you have to show evidence that you are moving ahead, mm -hmm. and then you can ask for the fines not to be imposed, and you will get granted another extension. I know this from direct professional experience. The problem is, at least I, I hope this building now, having the professionals in place, can start making those applications. They're not always granted, that's all because the because facade is public safety. So there's a real serious push by DOB. Sometimes from in my professional work, we've gotten them granted, other times we have not gotten them granted. But I, I think McCarry, you're pretty aware of that, of trying to- Yeah, sure and actually that. we did pay a $3,000 fine um, and it was because we couldn't get our scaffolding up quite fast enough. I think we missed the, the deadline by a month or something like that. But, um, and we didn't know if we had any recourse in terms of explaining that we're right. affordable housing. So. Yeah, they, I mean, when it comes to public safety, there's a lot of from DOB like they don't care because it's about public safety. 
but it, but as long as they're, they have professionals now on top of it administratively, they can request extensions and it has been done a lot. Um, so I think we have the beginning of a motion from JD on this that first, I'm, I think we, we should formally write to Conic to ask them to continue to meet with the board and the HDFC to come to a final agreement on the outstanding items and request that the items that the HDFC needs to take, be taken care of, that they make a financial agreement with them or settlement, however we put it. So they're doing it, the HDFC is doing it on their own. The second letter would be to HPD requesting, number one, to meet with the board and the HDFC and to assign a project manager to get this critical facade work done to maintain the, the long-term affordability of this co-op. We'll, we'll flesh that out, but I'm saying those are the guts of the two things. Does that sound right, J.D.? Well, yes, Joe, that's right. I was also wondering if we could ask Jesse to set up a meeting with HPD and Eric and yep. uh, McCann uh, and, and you and Maria to start talking about this. Yes, J Travis. Sorry about that. Thank you, Joe. Um, I think all this sounds great. I just have one concern that the settlement that Taconic comes to um, off of the building won't be enough to mitigate uh, any potential fines that go on in the, in the interim. No, no, the, the, sorry. Taconic is not involved in the facade and, and, and the fines. That's a separate matter. Okay, but Taconic's only involved in, 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 in providing funds to do renovation, to do repairs that were caused by the construction damage. Oh, okay, okay. They're, they're entirely two separate tracks. There are two large issues that happen at the same time. Got yeah, it. they happen at the same time. Right. And they're not related, but we we're talking about them at the same time. Oh, I thought, I thought the construction caused the issues. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I think with the JD's clarification about requesting to have a meeting, uh, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second for the two letters? Second by Betty. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, all those present and eligible. Abstain. Perfect. We carry and group, thank you so, so much. I hope this was pretty painless to come and make a presentation <laughs> to us and understand the pain continues after the meeting as we try to do follow up meetings and discussions to get you some satisfaction here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very appreciative. Yeah, really appreciate it. Good to meet everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to go to our affordable housing plan. Get ready, everybody. Did everybody receive the plan in the Dropbox? Yes? All 117 pages of it that are, some are mostly complete, some are not. Remember, we've gone through a lot of this already. So can everybody see the plan? Yes. Okay, so let's remember, this, this is the presentation side of it. There's a whole written part in the front, but we have gone through a good chunk of this already. I'm gonna zip through those portions we've gone through. We have a map, the site's completed. We spent all of our last meeting talking about that, but it's been completed. So I'm gonna literally page through them. Don't get whiplash, all right? All the buildings completed, a, a page for every building. Savannah is working with Jesse and Patty Maltizos from the bid to verify all of the numbers on these pages. Because remember, these things came to us as projects, developments, and proposal, and the numbers have to be verified that that's what actually what got built. Those are all the ones completed. And just remember, we're talking about literally uh, 1,500, uh, 782 affordable units in this whole group. Under construction, again, don't get whiplash. Not that many, 312 West 43rd Street between 8th and 9th, that was a Euler. 550 10th Avenue, that is the Gotham building on the Covenant House site. 278 8th Avenue, that was the senior housing building in Chelsea on West 23rd and 8th Avenue. Uh, 400 West 57th Street, the building that starts and never finishes on 57th and 9th. 606 West 30th Street, the Lalazarian building is part of the rezoning of Block 675, and 601 West 29th Street, part of the rezoning of Block 675 between 29th and 30th, 11th and 12th, that the board heard about three years ago. And the pages for those buildings. So those in construction right now are 553 affordable units. Sites that have completed public review. 493 11th Avenue, also known as a slaughterhouse site. Chelsea NYCHA on Fulton and Elliott Chelsea campus. 207, 201, 207 7th Avenue, the Till building that came 
to us. The, and uh, Chelsea Nitra is the Hudson Guild site, the only one that's gonna be built. And then Captain Post approved back in 2015 and still not found a project manager at HPD. We have new slides and new images in here describing what happened on Chelsea NYCHA. We all have lived through this and gone through it. This really now creates a record of what is happening on Chelsea NYCHA. And I will note the entire plan we looked at at multiple locations throughout the both Fulton and Elliott campuses, only one, this one here, EC1, the current Hudson Guild site, is going to be redeveloped with new construction. And that's because with related companies who will now be the manager and, the, and who lease the Elliott Chelsea and the Fulton campuses were able to conclude a very high section per unit section eight rent reimbursement. And they will not need to build as many new buildings. Only one building will be built on the Elliott Chelsea campus, none on the Fulton campus. And that will be on the location of the current Hudson Guild with a new building on West 28th Street as recommended by Community Board 4 and the Chelsea National Working Group approximately 137 units. Those counts are obviously going to change as we figure out what exactly is happening there and the project is fully announced. 500 West 28th Street. This is an illegal demolition building that has been approved to be built. Related has never built the building, but it's gone through public review. Small, only eight, only four units total. Well, yes, question? Okay, the 201, 207, 7th Avenue, the Till building is being demolished and redeveloped as the proposed building on the lower right. Demolition has finally started on those buildings. It was, the project was only approved by OM. We, we approved it in 2019, and the project was only approved by the Office of Management and Budget three weeks ago. 493 11th Avenue, Slaughterhouse. We're all familiar with that. Now the numbers are plugged into the plan. Uh, Captain Post building on West 52nd Street, approved in 2015. Again, no project manager. A total of 719 affordable housing units. Actually, it's a little bit less. The numbers for Chelsea LA are wrong. Under public review, Hartley House 413 West 46 for supportive housing. Sorry, Joe. Sorry, can you just go back to that last slide? How many is it total that are done? Or um that have been, oh. we've completed the public review? It is actually, uh, the 348 is wrong. That was the total, if all the sites were built, it's 137. So 137 plus 350 plus, plus um, 21. And these numbers will be updated, obviously. Can I also ask a question about yes, ULERP? Yes, please, please. ULERP, yes. can you oh. explain a yes. little bit on ULERP? ULERP is the Uniform Land Use Review Process in which either a rezoning is accomplished by an agency or, an, or a private sector individual, and then runs through the entire process for an acquisition of city-owned property. So it's the public process which starts at the city the Department of City Planning, certified by the City Planning Commission, then it goes to the Community Board for 60 days, then it goes to the Manhattan Borough President, the, the Borough President for 30 days, then it goes to the City Planning Commission for 60 days, and then it ends up in the City Council for another 45 days. It's the entire public process, just like we've gone through with the MTA and the DEP sites, and all of, and some of these sites being city owned went through that. So, Seventh Avenue Slaughterhouse and Captain Post were all part of various ULERP approvals that happened. And you will note the approvals take a long time to start; they take a long time to do, roughly nine months. But then a site can sit for a while after being approved because there's a financing issue or. A, project management issue or an HPD issue, that, that, that sort of stuff. And I would again say to everybody, before <clears throat> we, this gets put out to the full board, all the numbers will get updated. The, the numbers is really a Herculean task and we're really pinning them down now. Katie? So um, just, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm understanding the slide correctly. So mm -hmm. the numbers that you just said of the total affordable housing units, it sounds like it comes out to 508 because you said it's 137 plus 350 plus 21. So that's 508. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Plus, plus another 30 because those, those weren't carried over to the next column. Those okay. two buildings, 500 West 28 and 201 7th Avenue happen to be 100% affordable. Okay, but so... Sorry, so that's 538 units. So you're, so that means that 
538 units. The public review is done. Correct. Okay. And then do we have somewhere else, like how many have actually been built or no? No, this is the, the that was the prior thing. There are, the first section was completed. The second section from our last meeting, by the way, it's been our, our last meeting on this in full, right? Was what's completed, what's in construction. Now the next stage is public review. Like we're sort of making our way back in the development process. Things that are 100% done versus things that are going, making their way through. Is that helpful to understand the, the broad picture? Yeah, and unfortunately I wasn't able to attend last month. So right. that's why I'm a little confused. But all right, so these, the 538 are the ones that, in the last few years, we've gone through the public review, but they aren't done at all. I mean, they yeah, they may be started, they, but they have not. Uh, so the uh, developers have been designated for Chelsea NYCHA, but they haven't picked up a brick, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 2017 Seventh Avenue demo permits just just approved. The financing is coming together for 493 Eleventh Avenue. Okay. Captain Post stuck in the HPD limbo. But these are basically related. the ones in the pipeline. No, no, it's beyond pipeline. These have finished their public approvals. We're coming to pipeline next. Questions, anybody on this section? Okay, now we're going to sites under public review. So that's where we were. So these are things that um, are being considered. These are the simplest ones. 705 10th Avenue, DEP site, 806 9th Avenue, MTA site. Those are in the middle of the Euler process and they're at various stages. The DEP, the MTA site left the community board and is now it's Department of City Planning, the City Planning Commission. The City Planning Commission will be voting on the recommendation for the MTA site June 8th. And then it goes to City Council for final review and recommendation. The DEP site is, is leaving the community board at the June meeting and we refer to City Planning. And we'll have our recommendation that will be distributed sometime uh, Jan uh, Monday or Tuesday to the full board. These two buildings here, Hartley and 454 West 35th Street are actually privately owned by not-for-profits. They do not require public review. However, the, the organizations have come to the uh, Housing Health and Human Services Committee and made presentations on multiple cases. And now we're working through the finance, they're being worked through the financing with HPD. Questions about this, this part of the process in general or not? Okay. And then there's a page for hey, each one. Eddie's waving. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah please let me know because I, I can't see all the people at the same time when I'm doing the presentation. Yes, Betty. I can't. Yeah, see I, I guess my question had to do with the public review title of some of these things. Like, um, would it make any sense to dis discriminate to um, designate something that goes through Euler? That's one official process, whereas public review could mean something different for some projects, like the, the Chelsea NYCHA projects. I, I don't think that that site will go through Euler, right? No, but that's already completed as public review because we had all of our public meetings and discussions about it. Oh yeah, millions so, of meetings, right, right. right, right. But, but I guess, so now, I, I guess maybe you might wanna um, have a footnote somewhere we do, Betty. Oh, about do. the public review, types of public review. We, we actually do. We say public approval to none in this case because it's privately owned and not for profit owned. But I think to put to put your note to describe this public review has many different forms. Okay. Okay. Maybe that's a good. It's just so people don't think that everything that says public review is Euler. Correct. I, I would say we should list the types of public review that can happen. Because okay. there are many types. Okay. Anybody else with a hand up? I can't see. <laughs> well, no. Someone's got to no. watch because I, I no. can't see the group. No. I can okay. see it. I can see it. I mean, so we're familiar with Hartley House and Thirty Fifth. They've come to the committee multiple times, and these two we're very familiar with. So that's a total together of affordable units. Of this is this one's not correct either. One has dropped out here. Of uh, a little over six hundred units. And again, I apologize, but the numbers are just ne not necessarily correct. Now, HPD development pipeline. We saw this at our last meeting also. Um, these are buildings that are owned by the city of New York or owned by NYCHA, sorry. But in the case of Harborview, which is 535 West 55th Street, 
the lead agency with his HPD, because that's how it was arranged. So these are all city-owned buildings that are in the HPD development pipeline. And we talked about these at our last meeting too. A small building on 25th and 10th, city-owned. And most of these are uh, Clinton housing um, lease buildings. Uh, the HPD development pipeline, Harborview. This was an RFP put out to redevelop the parking lot at Harborview and the basketball courts. And the RFP was pulled, redone, back and forth, it's been in limbo. We understand that this is probably being revived by NYCHA. We put in here the reviews. So the reviews, Betty, in this one would be a ULERP because it's a change of an urban renewal plan. There would be an RFP. The tenant association would have to approve the revised plan. And there would be a disposition by NYCHA through section 18, which is another kind of public review. Again, a city owned building being redeveloped for affordable housing, another city owned building for affordable housing, and yes, another city owned building. We've seen these Actually, before. Sorry, Joe, Joe. Go back. Can I ask, uh, yeah, uh, back to Harborview. Yep. Um, it's that number there, the total, the 230, Units? Yes. I don't. Uh, I guess I'm just not very familiar with this. So that number, that, that that's what could be built on the no. basket. That number is directly from the RFP, saying right. to build at least 230 units along a variety, a, a range of income bands, and that has been already. If there was a full community charrette with the uh, tenant association, um, I would say Maria, do you remember? Were you on the board at that point with this? No, that's so, well, JD, maybe you can speak to us. We spent a lot of, we spent years on this one. Yeah, and we had a great plan and then it was thrown over. So I don't know whose district is it now. It's, it's back to Gail's district, I guess. So let me just note for, for all the board members that have not been here for this. The board did a fully collaborative plan with HPD and NYCHA. One RF for an RFP. First, the developer was um, chosen. That developer had to be removed because of um, when the FBI comes to your office and takes the computers, you really can't oh be God. the successful, you know, bitter, right? So they put it out again, and there was another developer to be designated. The new Mayor de Blasio came in and decided instead of building a 22 or 23 story building, contextual, fitting with the adjacent properties, they would like to build a 50 story tower on this lot. Oh my. Right. Did not go over well in the community, you can understand, right? And since then, they just did not move it. It seems as if the new administration is thinking about trying to move this as part of the broader NYCHA redevelopment plans. Okay. Is that helpful, Katie? This isn't, yeah, but so this isn't affecting obviously the Harbor, the current Harborview apartments. This is in the parking lot next door. That's yes, but, but yes, but most important, any funds that come from the sale of this land as part of whatever we're doing, it's going to do, it's going to do renovation for the Harborview apartments. The, so the existing Harborview apartments. Yes, they are intimately ah. tied together. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. And, okay. and the entire design was done with the agreement of the Harborview tenants, building separation, yes. open space. We did a whole huge open space plan, like all that stuff that we spent years on just went out the window. Katie, I think you remember. Maria, I forgot her last name. Joe, you know her last name, the, the president at Harborview, uh, Maria, uh -huh, uh -huh. something or other. Uh huh. How can I forget her last name? Oh, I forgot. That's all right. You made me forget it, even though I know her. It's, it's not Garcia. Nope. No. No. Nope. But you're right. We talked to her and she's lovely. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving on now. So we're past the pipeline and now we're into a new pipeline. And this is a reorganization of some of the work we've done before. ESD is the Empire State Development Corporation. That is the State Development Corporation, analogous to Empire, well, to the um, to EDC, to um, yeah, to EDC on, on the city level, or state control. Um, there is a request because ESD has actually reached out to Manhattan Community Board Four, wanting to talk about all the property owns in in Board Four. So some of these are sites that have been here in the plan for quite some time. And they're slightly repackaged and put together onto one section. So let's go through them one by one. The first one is that has been here before 
is the former Voorhees campus, the Hunter College campus, 450 West 41st Street, been in the plan for years. The Quill Bus Depot for um, rezoning and, and, and use as combination bus depot and, affor and affordable housing, part of it being affordable. The Javits Marshalling Yards has been in the plan since the beginning. The additions are Site K. This is a block front between 35th and 36th Streets on 11th Avenue, for which an RFP was issued by the Empire State Development Corporation and then put on hold. That happened recently during this past year. And then the community remembers, or members of the community remember, the redevelopment of Bayview, the old um, prison former YMC, YMCA on 20th Street and uh, 12th Avenue. These are all state-owned sites. The new governor, uh, Huckle, is really interested in trying to work to figure out how to get affordable housing to happen on state-owned sites. So in, in discussion with the executive committee, it was, it was talked about, let's pull together any state-owned sites into one package to see how we could come up with plans for those state-owned sites. So here we're now in the first time in this plan for something that is slightly different. The last one is the intrepid parking lot. And I wanna go through to give you the complications. So um, Voorhees is uh, a, a state-owned site that was leased to City College. And when the campus closed, it reverts back to the state controlled by, um, a, by, the, by, by SUNY. Uh, the Quill Depot, the agency controlling it is the MTA, Intrepid Parking Lot. It's a state-owned site for VSD. It's leased to the Intrepid for parking. Bayview is directly owned by the state, but has been subject to ESD RFPs. Javits Center, Marshalling Yards, controlled by Javits, ultimately controlled by the state. And then Site K, Javits uh, uh, owned, ultimately controlled by the state. So I wanted to just take some questions on that so people understand that complexity. Questions, thoughts? Mm. Katie, yes, I see, you say, I, I, I see a thought. When you say Javits owned, but state yes. controlled. Because, because in the end, the state controls the Javits Development Corporation. The, the state of okay. New York, like, like the city, has public authorities and public and public benefit corporations. Right. The state does the appointments to all those corporations. So if the governor and the state legislature decide we want to do X, Y, or Z on a site, and the example right. is site K, Javits owns it, but ESD was given the authority to put out an RFP to redevelop the site. Okay. So maybe so that maybe explains answers my question. So you're saying for all six of these sites, yes, there is um, the state owns it or controls it enough that it that it can decide to do affordable housing or anything else it wants to do. That's correct. <laughs> yes. Okay. So for example, I guess I was just wondering like, or is there like a 50 year contract with the intrepid saying that they get to use it for a parking lot? And so we can only think about it this in 50 years. Every or single lease deal with the state will say in the event of a public need, blah, 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 whatever, they can be given notice and that's it. So, okay. So there could be a contract for some of these. Oh no. There, there, I, uh, there is a definite agreement with the Quill bus depot with the MTA. But if the state decides, here, well, the example is, huh, we're redeveloping something called the MTA site, right? On 54th and 9th, the state, owned, the city actually owned it, the state controlled it, and there was a decision made to redevelop it. That's the nature of how these things work. And Roberta and Betty have their hand up. Roberta. Sure. So. My understanding is that any proposed changes in this site wouldn't be subject to a traditional Euler. Are they also able to override certain portions of existing zoning? Could you talk a little bit more about that? I'm just not as sure. familiar. So, so the state of New York being a higher authority in government can override any zoning in any municipality in the state of New York. However, there's something called politics that enter into this. So <laughs> yeah. for example, um, when the, when the state put out the RFP for site K, even though you're only allowed six FAR residential, they actually said they would entertain a 12 FAR residential building plus commercial. Now, mostly in developments, the state will say, in the politics of it, we will comply with zoning. 
or if we're going to sell it, like for example, the city owned slaughterhouse site, but they offloaded the responsibility to rezone it through ULERP to a private developer. So even though they could sort of get around things and do an override, they, cho they choose not to. In all these cases, our community board would always ask for a public process to happen. And most likely that public process is gonna be ULERP because that's the stuff that is the normal, is the normal process that gets everyone through it. I think we should probably just note that in general on this, that for state sites, we want them to go through ULERP. Mm -hmm. that, is that- Is there a precedent for state sites going through I, I understand, and I think the governor released some sort of EO or some comment on May or ESD did about making the process more transparent, better involving communities, more public meetings. I think there was a, oh, it was a shareholders or some sort of ESD board that met today. I don't know. Um, well, so yeah, you're asking if there's precedent for state sites to go through ULERP? Yeah. Yeah, Times Square. Okay, went through ULERP. <laughs> Went through Euler. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Port Authority redevelopments right. going through Euler. This is a matter of, well, better yet, you know, the MTA site, city owned, state controlled, we're in the middle of a Euler. So none of that is unusual. It's about the politics of it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And final question about yeah. process here. If um, something goes through, I guess the, this, I answered my own question, but it, if there's the ULERP is only for it to override existing zoning. No, the ULERP would be to make it, it might be a change for use. It might be a change, in, like, let me give some examples. Site K is a high density zone of mm -hmm. like 24 FAR. So not a need for more density. However, there's a limit of six FAR residential. So that's, that's the change. The Javits Marshalling Yard is M23. It's got an FAR of two. That would have to go through a full Euler to be rezoned for use for residential. So it's right. varying depending upon site. Uh, Betty, next. And then JD. Yeah, then yeah JD. I, I, I'm most familiar with Bayview on West 20th Street because it's in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like it's kind of different from uh, the other sites because it has this big building that was a jail before. And it's kind of a stretch to suggest it for affordable housing. I, I think, see, you know, it has all these tiny little rooms. And Betty, it's a building. You can do whatever you want with it. It's a building. For, forget the proposals we've heard. It's a building. Well, it, it is a building, yes. <laughs> yes I just wonder if, uh, if it is in the same vein as these other sites, which don't have buildings on them. Um, in the prior section, we had a bunch of buildings. Some were loft buildings. Some were commercial buildings that are city owned. They're being converted to housing. I mean, you need to step to a, a 30,000 feet. And what, because we have a plan, we can request whatever we'd like to happen. Because the issue we've had is that that site prior was sort of limited as to what people responded to. So our community should be able to say, we'd like X, Y, or Z in that building you feel not you feel not not confident. well um i just wonder how realistic it is for us to propose affordable housing in that building that's all i, I won't argue about it i just it's just it would be incredibly expensive to convert that building to usable affordable housing so i got i have to note to use the opposite all of these other things are sites they are ground up construction, having to dig foundations and to do a major rezoning. That building compared to these other locations is a slam dunk walk in the park, period. It's, it's, it's got a foundation. It's a building, it's got partitions. If they're concrete, rip them out, reorganize them. I mean, it's not that. Okay, not okay, that okay. all right. Okay, you, 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 you make a good point. I just was thinking about what, what you could do on that in that building, but. I guess it would just be expensive, that's all. Uh, but everything else is more expensive, maybe. Anyway, uh, that's it. JD followed by Leslie. Oh, you can see, and then Sabrina and also Carl Wilson. I can see a few yeah, attendees. It's now that, like the, the, the hand people are moving up to the top so I can see them. Oh, okay. Uh, the Intrepid JD? parking lot, the Intrepid parking lot, 600 West 45th Street, the board, the community, 
did not want Trump Towers to come down there and block the waterfront. So we got it rezoned, I think, Joe, what, 13 stories now. Yes. If it's the state and we see a lot of even people on the board are pushing for higher density in residential. And this is coming from the state. So this to me is a concern. So could I ask that could I ask that we state as we go to each slide, that's what we need to get his input on these. I'm trying to get I, just questions about the general state ownership thing, and then we'll go through one by one. So we'll come back to that, JD. Leslie, are your questions about the whole general process or not? Yeah, it is in, in a way. It's also part of a discussion we had before. Given COVID, when a hotel or such or office building falls into disarray or can it go back to the city or the state so that the state or city takes control of it and then falls onto this? The only way that would happen is if the most buildings like that have a mortgage on them. Okay. And if the mortgage holder would take the building back first, only if the mortgage holder chose not to pay their real estate taxes would the city be able to take back a building. I would find it highly doubtful if, the, if someone holding a hundred or $200 million mortgage would not just take the building back and then seek to repurpose it themselves. That's um, the usual. even our location, not, not probably. Okay. Uh, Sabrina, on the general process, then we'll get into the sites. Yes, general process. So um, I just, um, I was thinking about what Betty said, that essentially having a building that is already built, right? It's cheaper and it's, Eat faster or easier to convert into affordable housing that that's the premises well yes because you don't have to build a foundation you don't have to rezone the site I mean, on the other sites with I would how about permits there. and stuff like that though doesn't because what about if uh, it's out of, i guess well i guess you can rebuild if a building is out of code or something like that they can fix that right yeah yeah you are as a not-for-profit developer i can tell you Give me a building any day and starting out with a whole new. Starting new. Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of indeterminate and difficulties you have, well, actually you saw it. You saw it in the, in the um, Park Clinton discussion. You can be digging your foundation and something collapses adjacent. Right, uh, like what just happened. But, yeah. And the complexities of getting foundation approval take at least sometimes a year as opposed to a building you're starting with. So, yeah. and, and that's just the foundation, not the building itself. Yeah, no, I know. Per, yeah, capital projects. Yeah. Um, okay, that was my question and on process. Thank you. Good. So I want to start on sites then, one by one. So Betty, look, we have number one, Bayview. Um, so this is um, the old information, right? Um, we're going to remove all this about Novo and everything like that. What do we as a, a committee, what would we like to see or propose for this location? Let's go around the room on that. Leslie, your hands up. Slop, no? I'm going, it's gonna start with you, Betty, because you're the most human in this forever. And then we're, oh. Oh, got it. Roberta, oh, sorry. Roberta, go ahead and, and then Betty will come in. Um, so I do appreciate, or appreciated the previous proposal. Um, I would, uh, appreciate, you know, the lower AMI bands of affordability at this site in particular, because yeah. there is not a great deal of um, affordable housing that's been built in Chelsea, at least in the past, um, you know, decade, um, particularly not reaching um, the, you know, extremely low income income bands. Um, do I have a very specific preference for this particular project? I do not, but um, it sounds, it sounded like a good project um, overall. I would want it to be adjacent to what was proposed previously. So there, there was no housing here originally at all. This was all a social service center. So what, I, what I'm gonna throw out something people to talk about. I think this building, given the fact that it was a Y and has, as Betty note, noted, a number of small rooms. Um, maybe this is a place that we could recommend a combination of supportive housing, but also beds for mental health because we don't have that at all in our district. What and do you mean by beds for mental health? That population 
that cannot really succeed in supportive housing, that needs much more supervision round the clock. What do you do with that population that just needs more, you know, like serious assistance all the time? You're, you're talking about more intense supportive housing, not yes, inpatient like, or, you, or inpatient. Well, well, I think it's a combination of both. It's people that, that, I mean, we talk about this in our committee all the time. What do you do with the population that just is not supportive housing ready, right? They need care, they need assistance, they need support. There's nowhere, it's like the safe haven idea kind of is out there, but it doesn't really address the severity of the need there. Joe, where's the so nearest a, facility for that to, uh, to our community? That's the problem. It's the psychiatric beds across the state have been closed. It's, they're like so few of them. I mean, I mean, we the, got the numbers BRC, for you, right? BRC does have safe haven beds. Right, I'm, I'm talking beyond. No, I know, but you, you kind right. of, Lump yeah. them together, and then he said, "Where are those beds?" So I just yeah, wanted. I'm sorry, yeah, I, I'm talking the next step in care above safe haven, where you really have twenty four seven. Oh yeah, you yeah. know, like people living, engaging, trying to figure out get people stable because it's this ability. I mean, imagine something that could be not you go to Bellevue for five days and you're out on the street again, kind of thing. You know? And isn't this something that Eric Botcher has been talking about too? I think half the world's been talking about it. That's the, you know. But I think so specifically the, our council member, yeah. Our council member and our state senator, everyone's been sort of adding on this. I'm gonna to go to Pete and then uh, to Roberta again. Um, I, I do recall this item came before us back in around 2008, 2009. Yep. And there was a propose a proposal for- Everything has failed, it's closed, they're done, they're finished. It's back, okay. on, the, it's back on the boards again, all done. Okay, um, maybe the board uh, can you can uh, verse the a board on, on what took place back then just a bit? There were there was an organization called the Nova Foundation to create a, a women's center. Uh, they went through a number of iterations. Um, they proposed uh, changes to the building, rezoning. We went through a whole process. We approved it. That plan failed. They came back with another plan. They had another developer, and after about two years, they decided the building was not for them. And they withdrew. That's what happened. Thank you. Um, other thoughts about the idea of a combination of, and I agree with Roberta, like if, if the lowest income units should be in this location, because I think that's the, the population that needs the most. Um, Joe, I'm, I'm not sure when you want to go to the public, but earlier Carl Wilson had his hand up, but now Brian Weber does instead. So well, I don't I think know if you want to wait think, till the end. Yeah, I really think yeah we have to have committee on this whole plan stuff and okay. see what should add in. Uh, Katie. All right. Yeah, I think um, having it be um, for those uh, struggling with severe mental health issues is a great idea. Um, that's clearly something that needs to be addressed in our city. And as you say, there's been a lot of discussion about it. I will say just to add to Jessica's point, BRC has it. I'm sure others do too. And it, uh, not just safe haven beds, but they have specific. Um, uh, programs for people struggling with severe mental illness. But as we also know that there, there, are, there are real challenges because, you, you know, you can't. You need real intensive funding to do this. Like it's right. not like. And, a but, but there are also just sort of rules, as we know, like they closed down all the hospitals and you can't force somebody to go get this mental health help. So anyway, we'd have to sort of see but, how that. But, yeah, but that's already started to change. Remember, the governor passed that reform to Kendra's law that actually gives the ability to, to do more circumstances requiring assisted outpatient treatment to actually have someone get treatment. So that's mm -hmm, sort right. of like, because general trend happening, this might be a good way to plug into that. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul is, uh, sorry, Leslie and then Paul. Yeah, Joe, a quick question. If we go this route, what involvement would we have in selection of the provider of those services at this time? Normally our community board's role is not in selection of the selection of the respondent. We help develop the RFP to begin with, to lay out the parameters as to what should be or not be in the building. And that's a very helpful and serious public role to lay out the building is X number of square feet, Y number of apartments for this or Y number of rooms for that, a provider with uh, you know, 10 years of uh, history or whatever. We, we would come up with those rules and that helps shape the project going forward. 
um, going to Paul and then Roberta. Yeah, in general, Joe, I think it's an excellent idea. Uh, I, I'm sure not, I'm not the only person who's noticed how often uh, politicians of late have been mentioning. <laughs> I guess it's good that they're at least mentioning the idea that so many of the problems we all face and our city faces have a lot to do with mental uh, illness of some one sort or another. I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I love the idea of going forward. I'm just wondering, well, we, we certainly have had a lot of experience with good, bad, and indifferent providers. Um, I yep. think more than, well, more than, more than all but two other community boards in the entire damn city. We're number three. I, I would, uh, I don't know. This is just a huge lift in terms of time spent on it. But we, we do have a lot of stories about what not to do because we've had, you know, a, a parade of folks who just aren't, aren't aren't as good at providing what they say they want to provide. I, I think it's a great challenge. I'm all for it. Um, you know. The only thing we should be prepared for is someone's going to say, well, yes, that's their idea of taking care of the mentally ill. Put them in a woman's prison. <laughs> you know, okay, it's a YM, it's historic YMCA. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I think it's um, a lovely so, idea. Very interesting. It's a lot of work, but I, you know, I, I, I like it. So I want to take a few more speakers here. We cannot spend our entire night on this one thing, I'm trying to get concept settled, right? So go yeah. to Roberta, Jessica, and then Betty. I just wanted to bring up, I think Katie was referencing a plan or a proposal from uh, council member Botcher earlier. He was, I believe, referring to the clubhouse model, which has um, been kind of, I think, brought to life by Fountain House um, in Hell's Kitchen and elsewhere. And it, you, that might be a jumping off point. I don't know if that's exactly what you'd wanna see here. It sounds like you'd want something a little bit more supportive, but maybe you take that plan and use it as a jumping off point of some language, um, you know, clubhouse plus, you know, supportive, additional supportive services, something like that. Okay, Jessica, then Betty. And Betty's our, Betty's our, our last speaker on this. Sure, I just, and Joe, you and I, we had talked about this a couple of months ago in a, in a separate conversation and I thought it was great. I, I like the idea, I think, talking though with providers or, or mental health professionals, specifically because I think this location, while good, is also quite challenging. For one, the highway is right there. Um, and just as it relates to congestion, disruptive behavior, suicidal tendency, I don't know, there's just like, there's just a lot happening right there. And also like the distance to public transportation and grocery stores and other other services that might be needed. Um, and so getting a, a better understanding from providers about what makes an ideal site to offer. The, I mean, I know we're, we don't, we're, we don't have any options here. You know, you but, know, we're in the super conceptual mode. I think there's a whole of bunch course, of due diligence that but, happens as long as we put it out of there. Of course, see. but we are being actually very specific. So we're not saying, is this a good site for potential housing when, it, when actually the last provider wasn't proposing housing at all. You're actually going right. You're not saying, is this a good site for housing? You're saying, is this a good site for for potentially psychiatric beds. So I think if we're gonna have that conversation, we need to be prepared to do that. If we wanna say, is this a good site to consider for housing? I think you're hearing, yes. I, I would say if we do something as simple as to say a combination of psychiatric beds and supportive housing in a new model in order to serve the most needy people, something like that, that's kind of enough to put out there. Betty, you have a last word on this one, and moving on. Yeah, um, no, I really do like the idea of some kind of mental health supportive housing, what you were saying. I think that it says project description on the slide. It's a little confusing. No, Maybe no, should... those, those are, we're, we're revising. That's all coming off it. Oh, oh, okay. All right. But I think this, on the other hand, putting in something about supportive mental health, blah, blah, blah. Right. This is the old okay. slide. Okay. Thanks. Good. Perfect. <laughs> right. We really beat this one to death, but we did a good job on it. So let's go to our next state site. This is the marshalling yards, right? In general, what we would say here is for zoning, we talk about anything, that this would be consistent with adjacent zoning, right? So we're not getting, you know, 50 story buildings at all. And we would plug in the board standard range of apartments, range of affordability, which really runs from like 60 to 165 throughout. So it gives that broad range. And it's not as if we're coming up with a formula that's the finished formula. We're just saying, look at this. The only uh, caveat here is we must reserve 2FAR 
where the Javits use, because this is their marshaling yards, where they park the trucks that make the deliveries to the Javits Center. And they have to have a space for them to be held over the week of the various shows. And what's very good about this site is it actually slopes toward the river. So it's a different grade entirely, and you can slip more stuff underneath it. Jessica? Well, just uh, going back to Jeffrey's earlier initial comments, I think this would seem a site to consider potential alternatives to FAR uh, given its location. Right. Um, to note, right today, we don't have any, what we can put in our housing plan today is about hitting 12 FAR. Right now it's two FAR, right? And that's our maximum. We are, are gonna talk in general, we talked a lot about the, the changes to the um, FAR caps, right? I think that's a section we put in general to say we have interest in discussing. We've had a whole letter back, back and forth. But if we're make, making a recommendation, we have to stay within what exists today. That's all. Like, for example, Jessica, we could say this could go to 14 FAR because two is reserved for the truck stuff and 12 for, res for residential. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I, th I don't know yet exactly the format in which this will be written, but I think there's a way of without being prescriptive to say what the FAR right. should be, to just say that this has a lot of potential. And as this is being looked at, you know, given its location is, a pro you know, there, there's uh, more, potentially more to be gained from developing this site than just what is immediate avail immediately available. So I, I would know that we say maximum residential FAR and then know that's gonna fall out in different ways, Katie? Actually, I guess, Joe, this is a question uh, more about process. I'll, I'm just coming to be sort of late, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm wondering, so I'm so curious as to why we're coming up with like a different idea or plan for each of these sites, as opposed to saying, okay, here are all these sites. And so, and here are the things that we would like to see in our community. We'd like to see more, of, you know, We'd like to see some mental health um, uh, beds. We'd like to see uh, affordable housing, you know, in these uh, bands. Um, uh, and we want to see, you know, consistent with neighboring buildings and FAR or whatever. But like, I guess I'm wondering why are we- Right, the, the affordable housing plan has always been quantified since we first published it in 2015. And that's because the elected officials, policymakers out there, when you speak in general terms, you get general responses. Right. We put out something specific saying, this site can be used for this. And then we have a calculation matrix. That is, here's where the FAR is, here's the square footage. You do, and there's actually a methodology slide at the end. You do, you subtract like 15% or for public, uh, public, um, public circulation space. That gives you a net square feet. You divide that by 850, which is the city standard for apartment size and that gets you X number of apartments. Because in many of these sites, it's a combination of market rate and affordable in order to get the thing to happen. And so we keep saying this, and we, it's interesting. The very things we put out, Katie, in the plans between 2015, 16, 17, many of them have happened because we put out that, that very specific go to this or go to that. Because the sites are complex sometimes. This one, for example, has a combination of development rights available from inclusionary if it were rezoned, but also it's a Hudson River Park development rights transfer site. So there's a whole section in coming up that talks about that. So I would say, look at the plan in total. It's so like it's zoning and suggestions and what's happening here though, at the executive committee's uh, suggestion, we're combining all the ESD sites into one grouping because ESD has actually said they'd like to talk to us about those sites. We've never been that prescriptive before here. We've only said general rezone them. That's why this is something that's kind of, it's not new, but it's a, it's a switch. It's a little change in how we- It, it felt it. like a switch. Okay, all right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah exactly, exactly. Um, right. Let me go to the next one. And that's the Quill uh, Bus Depot. Same sort of thing. So look at it as a development site, but retaining a certain number of FAR for the bus garage. So you're building on top of a bus garage. Stranger things have happened. Um, this, is, this, this, is, this is site K, right? Here, old information here entirely, get redone. And we drop in, we know this is actually in play. 
This is going to be RFP again. The governor has signaled she wants to put this out for an RFP. And in fact, really would like to see majority residential, not the residential or commercial RFP that came out before. Hmm. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Question, Maria? Oh, no, I was just, <laughs> I have to turn my mic off. I was just saying, oh, geez, that's far. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> then, we have this, then we have this 450 West uh, 50, 41st Street. This is again um, a, a part of the state sites. And this has been the same in the plan since, since uh, 2015. The FAR is lower here. And I'm going to note every single slide now for development will note what the current FAR is and what we propose. And then here we have the um, Shepherd parking lot site. So I think JD's comment is rather important in that we want to say here, I'm assuming that we stay within the existing zoning. This was rezoned back in 2009 as part of Western Rail Yards. And it, it, there's a height limit here of uh, 13 stories. JD, you want to speak more about that? Uh, yes, that was a hard one battle. We wanted to extend the special Clinton district to 12th Avenue and make it residential. That was our long term goal. Uh, we wanted to keep it at the height limit we have, but uh, city planning, we finally came down to 13 stories and they wanted to preserve UPS and, and Verizon, the warehouses. My question here though, if this is a state owned site that overrides city zoning, the other sites could fit in with tall buildings in the context of Hudson Yards, 42nd Street. But this is Clinton Health Kitchen low rise. So, so first, with, yeah. yeah, first I want to note, we're going to put a, a general piece of information and we want all the state sites to go through ULERC so there's no overriding of zoning. That's a, that's a basic parameter. The second thing here is there's no reason this site could not be 100% affordable because it's owned by the state as opposed to the current language that's highlighted, you know, partially affordable, right? Um, with the special district actually goes to 12th Avenue, but the community's request was to have residential use on, on the west side of 12th. The Department of City Planning agreed to only on, have residential use on the east side of 11th Avenue. So from 11th to 12th, it is M24 manufacturing, so you can have commercial use, but no hotels. So there we are, and we're coming back in 2009, many years later, to say, come and try to bring residential use in these blocks. Roberta? I was just hoping to get a little more information about this particular discussion, because it sounds like it's played out over time. It sounds like the primary contention with having a potentially taller than 13 story building here is just broadly contextual um, and not necessarily about uh, like light and air or uh, public health or safety or anything of that nature. Is that Yeah, correct? it was, it was, it was, it was the concern about creating towers on the river adjacent to the low rise special zoning district. So in the mid blocks between uh, eighth and uh, a regular boundary to 11th, the height is limited to seven stories on the avenues to 10. When you go west, we were able to achieve a limit of 12 or 13 stories on 11th. And the last thing anybody wanted at that point was to say, let's jump to 45 stories or 50 stories on the west on the river, because that certainly would make a huge difference. It would encircle the low rise and create more pressure. Eventually. You're, you're right about that. Was there a community con uh, consideration of um, allowing maybe not 45 stories, but additional either bulk or height um, yes. or more affordability or 100% affordability? Because I could see maybe that being a place where people could have that conversation. Part of the negotiation was the community board said, we'll take more bulk if you keep the height lower. And city planning was no, it was just a, you know, it's a different point in time. Uh, so that, that's, that's the problem. Well, I guess that's, that's less of my question more. Oh. Would the, there be, I don't want to create a, you know, a huge issue, but would there be open community discussion to greater height or either or city planning discussion for greater affordability? Um, I, I think, I think that's a discussion to have 
if the site plays out at all yeah. in general. And, and the whole issue, again, if you look at the blocks between 11th and 12th from 43rd up, there's lots of vacant land. Yep. There's a question of how things get assembled, what happens, and we have to make sure whatever we do on one hand doesn't create precedent on the other. So I think there's always a flexibility to figure it out if there's more affordability, but you have to, it's when you talk about that in the discussion. Okay, I hear that. You know I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. Like when there's an actual something at in hand, you'd have to negotiate an RFP. What does that mean? How could it happen? So we don't end up with, let's put 50 stories there. It's a piece of state land. That's that. That's JD's immediate concern. And quite frankly, the community would be very concerned about that from a broader point of view. Yeah, no, I, I'm hearing that. Um, I don't know if there's just a way to express that. I mean, I think that we, that's like the broad thrust of a lot of this is if right. you would take more bulk or more height for more affordability. So that would just be my one comment there that I don't know. Like, I think that a lot of that depends upon the location. And because in Hudson Yards, we have a lot of bulk there already. I think we're, we're gonna probably try to direct the residential bulk, bulk down south where it really can be absorbed. I see you're, you're reluctantly nodding. I get that. Part. Yeah, I mean, like, old, I'm. Sh this is a very specific, but it is. It's a parking lot, um, and there isn't a ton of residential um, that kind of like west of Eleventh. A lot of it is commercial. I have, you know, folks. I feel like I talk to people all the time about. I wish this were, you know, a much bigger housing building. I wish this wasn't a car dealership. Whatever. And so it, it's kind of coming. The, the, the city of New York refused residential use. So part of this is going to be just trying to get the residential use yeah. west of 11. That's like the biggest lift, honestly. In this. I'd like to move on because we we're, we're ready. We're ready at 816. And this, these numbers are not correct. We'll just do this again. The formula at the end that sort of says, here's how you calculate roughly. And then we spread the um, uh, AMIs across the bands pretty much from 60 up. Yes, uh, who's, there's two people raising their hands. Roberta, no, who else? Sorry, I, well, I, well, the other person is just Brian, we is Brian Weber. Okay, um, I wanted to finish with committee. But I don't think we're at the end, right? No, we're not, we're not by any stretch. Okay, <laughs> oh, page 66, sorry. <laughs> 66 folks were halfway through, okay? <laughs> so now these, these, these two locations have been in the plan since 2015. And one is a Port Authority owned lot, right? And the other one is the Morgan Annex. The Morgan Annex, when it was built and demolished lots of buildings down in Chelsea, was built with columns to build a residential building above it, but only on, I'll do that one first, only on a 200 by 200 foot section of the building on 9th Avenue. We have this in there. This is a federal negotiation with the um, uh, Postal Service. Here is a small, parking lot on Port Authority land. And again, as part of the Port Authority discussion, we've left it in so it can be discussed. Mm. Again, not changed from, from, from the beginning of the plan. Um, affordable housing preservation. We talked at our last committee meeting, we wanted to add in a strong preservation section. Jessica. Sorry, just quickly on that Morgan Annex. Um, I know this is like very housing specific and this comment that I'm about to make is not. But the air quality there is is horrible, and I don't know if it's in part because the way the building has been constructed and its use. But it's like, and I, I see Christine is in the um, attendees, and I know she's talked about air quality before. But I think it's as we look to make a case for why these things are why it's valuable to rethink this. I think talking about issues beyond just housing, when it affects all of us so significantly, might be worth considering. And Though I don't have the numbers any, about air quality yeah, on yeah. there. Anything built there would have to meet such a high environmental bar. You'd have to have a very tightly controlled building and filtered building for air without any question. But again, there's a deep community memory. When this demolished a number of buildings, the foundation for affordable housing was put in there. And it was actually conceived to be part of future part of Penn South and it never happened. So now I'm going to affordable housing preservation. We put in a section brand new legal demolition. And that just lists out, here's what happened. The district was established. It was changed in 87, changed in 1990. It said very clearly, you cannot do this. And then we had West Side rezonings and we protected more buildings in West Chelsea, Hudson Yards and the Garment Center. Um, 
We have a map now of illegal demolitions in the various districts, knowing where they happened. And then we have the buildings. I think this slide is very helpful to see a building, a building, and then nothing. To see buildings, and then all of a sudden demolished in a hotel partially built. See these two buildings together, and now they're sitting open on 38th Street. This to me is also very dramatic. A small residential building sitting here, it goes away, now there's a new condominium. I think we need to demonstrate that we're losing affordable housing, and that's what this next slide does. We have lost 151 units in 22 buildings, and we need something to happen. So this is the idea. Develop a zoning mechanism to cure or deter illegal and deter illegal demolition, illegal demolition, have a cure for illegal demolition, and to put a very high bar to say 40% affordable housing. If you do this and you demolish a building, you are going to have a heavy duty penalty. So let's have a discussion about this. We've talked about this a lot in this community. I have a question. You... Yes. Why Roberta. only 40? Oh, I didn't raise my hand, but I'm co-chair. So can I go ahead and Roberta, please? Thank you. Yes, you can. <laughs> I see you like giggling, Roberta. Why only 40 percent? Because and not whatever, high. Penalty, whatever penalty you have it cannot be so severe that it's considered an illegal taking of property and it can be challenged under zoning. That if it's okay. so punitive, you can be sued saying it is actually you're taking my property. I can't develop it. Roberta. Okay. Thank you. So very on board with the cure piece, I think <laughs> that sounds great. Now, the question I have is what zoning, do you have a zoning mechanism in mind? And then I guess I have a comment on, on that broadly. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just, we should, we'll flesh this out more. It should be built on the cure for harassment zoning mechanism. Yeah, yeah, okay. And just take that language, rephrase it and redo it saying, it's a cure for illegal demolition or demolition without permits, whatever, how you, you know, like, because I think this is the problem. An owner can just do it and then slide away because there's no, there is no remedy. And that happened when there was no harassment remedy before 1990. The answer was leave the building vacant, I don't care, you know, so. Yeah, um, just the one only comment I'll make is I feel like special Clinton district, is, it's, that is the, the anti-demo, like it has the most strict anti-demolition provision. No, no. It's exactly, it's, it's the same in all of them. Special Clinton, Hudson Yards, West Chelsea Garment Center have the same provision. It's mirrored. And then the, I guess that it would be the, that like height limit, it, it seems very anti-speculative already. And so I don't know if you like, if there's additional stuff you would layer upon well, that. Um, and I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you the example here. Sure. And here is the 35th Street building, right? It went through the entire land use committee. The developer committed to keep the two buildings right here and to build a hotel above it and behind it. And the developer went ahead and just demolished the buildings. Like that was a whole public process that happened. And when the garment center rezoning happened, there was a specific piece of text put in to allow that to happen. And the developer just ignored it. So you can do something that gets you the full density as long as you preserve the housing and okay. they, had, they had agreed to do it and also restrict it. Okay, so my only comment is just cure rather than any additional zoning recommendations right. beyond the harassment. Thanks. Right. Uh, Travis and then Betty. So I'm assuming that 40% is in alignment with like precedent in New York City. For, like, oh no, I'm making that up Travis right now. Okay, so I want to know you got that number. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. So then how do we know that this is a lawsuit proof? Then? What is, what is uh, you know, I actually think we have to put out just a number and then this becomes a discussion. Okay. No. I mean, by the way, 28% was a negotiated number. 28%? In the cure for harassment, it's 28% uh -huh. of the floor area must be permanently affordable to cure your harassment. Okay. The community actually asked for 30, 35%. And the back and forth ended up at 28%. Okay. Betty? Um, this is probably a little naive, but um, I wonder if we could put something in about DOB uh, having stricter enforcement, because once they start tinkering with the building and taking the roof off or something, mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, if, if, if it could get stopped before the whole building gets ruined, 
that's I, I I don't know. Maybe that's maybe maybe we ask it here that it's not just a zoning thing, but there'd be a, like a special unit or something set up at DOD okay. yes. that is specific yes. about enforcement. Okay. And it's like it's an emergency. They have to immediately deal with it. Okay. Other thoughts, anybody? Oh, JD? Yes. I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm sorry to hear confused. The proposed cure for illegal demolition, if the building is already 100% affordable, it should go back to 100% affordable. Right, but most of these buildings are not 100% affordable, they're rent stabilized buildings. And therefore they are affordable just because of their nature of regulation. Um, the thing that- If they're 100% rent stabilized, that's affordable housing, they should, be reconstructed as 100%. However, in some cases, the zoning permits more FAR. And how the cure for harassment reads, it's 28% of the building <clears throat> that is harassment occurred or 20% of the entire development site to have a disincentive for people to make the, cure, the harassment just part of cost of doing business. In the same way, it's important to have a disincentive to make demolition as the cost of doing business but they should restore the same number of units at least. It actually is more JD. It, it would be more. Okay. It'd be more. Other thoughts about this but, item? I've got well, to, JD's, to JD's point, isn't there a way to say that it will result in no fewer than the existing number and or? It, it needs to be square footage because you never have an idea. It, it's gotta be, it's gotta be the, the square footage of housing demolished. I think that's the way to do it because you can't count the numbers necessarily. A new building might be built in a different physical way and we don't want to get the same number of half the square footage. Right. I hear that. I just also don't think <clears throat> you want to say that suddenly you're offering, you know, we know that there aren't like a lot of, for example, three bedrooms and suddenly you're offering two, three 2,000 square foot apartments at affordable instead of 10, Roberta, you're, you don't think that would happen? So, no, so the, the cure for harassment doesn't say that. It says the opposite. It says get the square footage and you have to go through a public process to get the cure approved. So we'd have a public process here to get the demolition cure approved and we'd be able to weigh okay. in at that point. Because who okay. knows? The real problem is it's like there's too many variables we wouldn't know. Uh, when, when, a, when a site gets demolished, what if it's narrow? What if it's wide? Uh, you know, it's hard. To, but I think we need to say that 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 language. We're, we're going to track the language from the cure for harassment because that does give us gives the community board a public review process. Makes sense, Jessica, or not? Um, anything else on this one? Okay, let's move on to our next section, the big one. 421A affordable units, okay? Um, so we have, we talked about in our last meeting, there are 1,058 units 421A will expire on between 2022 and 2027. And the proposal we have is to work with the New York State Legislature to develop strategies, mechanisms, and tax incentives to create permanent affordability on these 20, on these 1,058 units. The next two pages, there's a, there's a map followed by the list of where the units are. Uh, thoughts or questions on the concept? Uh, I think it's a great idea. Um, also, because I live in one, and I know that some of my neighbors believe they have to move mm -hmm. um, when the time expires, so. Um, I think we are now have, we're down to the, there's, there's a lot more to go, which we're probably not gonna be able to do tonight, but what I'd like to do is the public has not been recognized at all. And if we can have some of those public mem uh, members of the public ask, oh, I have participants ask questions, yeah. So let me just go back for a second. Oh, I forgot how to do this. I'm gonna stop the share for a second. But I know can Nellie you, is here and can do it. Yeah, Nellie, can you bring over- Christine uh, and two, Brian. Christ, uh, yeah, Christine and Brian, yeah. <laughs> and thank you both for waiting so much. Uh, Brian, you had raised your hand first, I guess, and then go to Christine. 
Hi, thank you, Joe. I actually came regarding the first item, but I stuck around because you guys are so much fun. Um, my, my question uh, is, is two things. One is more housekeeping. The other is a comment on what's been presented so far. Um, this plan, I know it's been worked on for many, many uh, sessions and months. Are you this evening voting on finalizing it or are you still gonna be having more public discussions about this? So that's part I'm gonna, one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna propose that we um, bring to the board the, session, the sections that we've looked at already, right? Mm -hmm. And that we're, we're already at two hours that we're not gonna get right. to the next, next group. And we can only digest this degree of information in pieces, right? right. But at least we should get part of it Update it so the full board can look at it and then come back with more. Okay. Let, me ask the, let me ask the committee members that question. Does that does, does that make sense to you guys? Like we we, we adopt part of it. Yes. Right? And then so we can really spend. But actually, time on Joe, it. didn't yes. you say that like a, a bunch of the numbers still have to be? Oh no like, no, those those will get distributed, uh, Katie, to the full board and all the committee members prior. So the but the numbers are the numbers. It's the concept here, right? That's what we're dealing with to do this, to do that. That'll all go out probably either either Monday or maybe Tuesday to all the board members to look at in advance. I'm sorry, so you're saying the numbers won't be fixed or the old language won't be replaced yet? No, the, the old language and the numbers will be updated by Monday or Tuesday oh. of next week. Oh, okay. Uh, on the sections that we've looked at, not, I not, understand. The, not okay. the stuff we okay. haven't gotten to yet. Got it. Um, and then I just wanted to ask a question about the ESD section. Um, I, uh, I concur with uh, the committee that whatever these projects are should go through ULERP. I think that's really important. Um, but I think, you know, some of the sites, uh, in fact, all of it warrants more public discussion um, because there's this vague notion like will about density, height, uh, and affordability. And um, I know you guys have tossed around a number of things here. Um, from my position, I, I think that uh, our sky is a valuable asset and I'm less inclined to give away height. Bulk is different than height. And so I think that's, a, that's an important discussion. I don't know if there's any determination being given about height here this evening. And then, you know, with respect to the specific sites, uh, I mean, I know there's been a lot of discussion about it tonight, but you know, I have to say that I, I think that Jessica uh, raised a lot of good points regarding the, the Bayview site. I'm very familiar with that location. It's right on the highway. It's right across from uh, David Werner's art gallery right next to the Jean Nouvel building. And I'm wondering if that is an appropriate location for uh, the level of use that is being suggested here. So I think there's so many topics to discuss with each of these sites. Um, I'm almost wondering if that section is fully baked as of now to go forward. I, I was going to suggest that we can uh, revise that section and bring it back to our next meeting, not a problem, and have more discussion. But remember, we're not coming up with specific projects for each site. The yeah. plan is here's what can happen. And mm -hmm. the fact that we started talking about that tonight is a great first start. And whatever the committee feels we should pull back, we should do, but let's get the things out that we're all in agreement with to begin with. Let's right. go to Christine. Thank you. Yes, great job as usual. Um, on your 421A, considering how many units are involved, this is like a huge chunk. Uh, a lot of families. I, I was wondering whether you all could spend a little more time on, as you were saying, Joe, we need to have a specifics to show people and tell them what is the policy, what do we want? And I think, I think because it is such a large volume, we, we may want to spend a little more time uh, so, getting in the weeds on that and, and saying, what are we going to do about that? So let me say, I think that's one of the issues that's pretty much citywide. And I think, let me go back to that language for a second, because I think this one is, is ripe to start the discussion on that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Joe, up front, I can't remember. Do you have a table of contents in this? Yeah, there, there's there's a whole section. This is just the presentation oh. part. There's a whole section, like pages and pages on this. So mm -hmm. I think that the language, Christine, that I, I thought would just start the conversation because it really is a conversation. Work of the legislature to develop strategies, mechanisms, and tax incentives to create permanent affordability. That's the thing. I don't know what the answer is at all, but like it's almost like let's get this to the floor in the next legislative session mm -hmm. because the development community has said over and over, they will keep these permanently affordable, but they can't. They're, this is all about a tax exemption, really. Yeah. What do you do? Because there isn't the, the affordable units don't create enough income to pay full income taxes. And it's a really odd program that says it's 30 years or 20 years or 25 years. The people don't stop being poor, right? Yeah. But the tax exemption goes away and the rents can't go up. So there's a great incentive to like change, have these come vacant. That's, that's what we want to avoid at all costs. And, and there is no protection currently if when they become vacant? Here, here's what it is. The current tenants are protected. They stay rent stabilization and rent stabilization. If somebody moves or dies, affordability is no longer required after the expiration of yeah. the 421 a period. And when is the expiration now? What, what, what's the plan? The expiration is all different for the buildings. You can see here in this chart, it starts, they really start expiring heavily in 2023 into 2024. Yeah, that's what it looked go. like 131. I mean, I, I don't think we have any time here. I feel like by, by reading this, I feel the tremendous pressure, like a crisis, you know. And right, but the idea of putting it out there, it, it was never, it was at the end of the plan. I think we should, I want to put preservation to the beginning of the plan, honestly. Yeah. Right. But but also also, you know, like you were saying, we need sometimes specifics and you had suggestion mm -hmm. about zoning, etc. I mean, whatever we can put our heads together and have suggestion, we we, sh we could at least put them on the table and say, look, you, you at a minimum, you have to do this. Right. And then challenge the elected to say, you can wait. This is like 131, 23. This is you right. can wait. You know, well, I know what's going to happen. The guys are going to go home and then they come to the next session. And <laughs> where do we have, do we have, and then they are going to go elected and everybody's busy being elected. And, you know, we, meanwhile, we have all these families which are at risk and this is scary. So I, I want to say again, one of the things Maria, Maria said is that if there's a misunderstanding that you're at risk. You're not forced to move. Right. You, the unit, you are still in rent stabilization. The issue is, if an unscrupulous developer tries to move people out and says they have to move, well, people won't know. I mean, part of it maybe be, Christine, we do a public information campaign to buildings, right? To make yeah. it clear that it's about if a unit's vacant. But I, I think just, that, yeah. No, I know what you're saying, but I, th I feel like a real risk because we can't, you are doing a, you're, committee and you are doing a fantastic job every time we have a crisis we go and you know with extinguisher right <laughs> but yes. look at the look at the volume we're talking about here we can't we can't be going at those things one by one when people say oh you push me out so let me suggest maybe we take this this isn't a plan but we take this matter up in a separate letter at our yeah. June meeting and bring this out in general as here's a crisis upon us kind of thing yeah and yeah. really amplify that because it, it is, it's not just part of the plan, Christine, it's, it's a broader issue. You're right about that. Right. No, no, absolutely. But I mean, you know, I feel scared for, I don't know any of these people. I feel scared for them. Thank you. Oh, good. Um, so let me come back to the, oh, Roberta. Yes. I don't know if in that letter regarding 421A, if there's a particular ask. It won't be, t it, it won't be tonight. It won't be tonight. It'll be in June. Great. Yeah, I won't talk about it. Good call. Okay. <laughs> so let's come back for a moment. And I would like to quickly put the plan up and just sort of say very, very quickly, the, the sections that we can bring to the full board, right? For the, 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 the June meeting. Hold on a second. In our 
first go, hold on a second. So the whole first section of the plan, right, which is about sites that were completed under construction, completed public review, under public review of the HP pipeline. I think these are all things we talked about at our last meeting. And we can update those individual slides. There's not really question or controversy. It's all the same stuff. It's really updating it. I believe that um, the ESD pact you put together merits further discussion. Do I get a nod on that from the, from the committee members? Yes, okay. I think the proposed development sites, two of which are the Morgan Annex and the um, uh, Port Authority site on 40th Street, they haven't changed at all. Can we bring those just to be re reconfirmed at the full board? Uh, Joe, I think uh, Jessica raised some questions about the Morgan Annex site. Yes, go. Sorry, Jessica raised some issues about that. Oh, my comment, I think my comment about the Morgan was really just concerned with the, frankly, the air pollution. Um, I don't know if that, if that um, influences the kind of site it is, but just rather that it has another uh, issue exacerbating the, uh, I don't know, the, I don't know if it's the use, but the sort of the existence of the site has its own set of, has resulted in some problems that are probably worth addressing. So um, where do we think, well, why don't we, again, let's put that particular item as a separate, where, where I'm sorry, let's ask Christine, where does that live, the air pollution issue? I don't think it does live in this committee in general. Jessica? I'm sorry, is the air pollution what? No, the issue of that, the Morgan Annex itself being a creator of air pollution, where does that belong in board committees? Oh, sorry, I guess I was just saying, I was, I was saying, I don't know. Well, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, okay. <laughs> maybe, but um, I don't know the answer to that question. I would like to think about that. Um, but I was also just, when I had raised it, I was saying, I don't know how we will be presenting each of these sites and like what profile we will be creating and what kind of information we might we might make available like the way I know you said you're changing the Bayview site on 20th Street that slide but you offered some context some historical context I think similarly I don't know if others have any information or if there's air quality information related to that site but that might be something interesting to note just as a way of uh, noting some characteristics about the site but why don't, again why don't we why don't we maybe just, just add a note that the, that the site has um that the site has, has, has high air, has very bad air quality, something like that. Because I think that's the only thing. Otherwise, this is the exact same we've had in place. Would that be helpful? Like air, like air is quality. This, is this the totality of what we would be presenting for a set like yes. for the site? Yes. Um, then I, I don't know that it's necessary here. Okay. So that means we can include this section, which is these two proposed development sites. I think we are. We can include under affordable housing preservation. We can include the illegal demolition section, and we can include the 421A just as something that we're noting. But we're going to take separate action on it at the June meeting. Do I get nods on that or not? Yes. Okay. So then to review, we're including the sections of what's happened. The Illegal de the preservation of illegal demolition of 421A, and we're including the, the proposed development sites, Morgan and Port Authority, but we're not ready yet to go to ES to take, we're gonna pull the ESD from our June discussion. And then in June, we'll discuss ESD down to all of the zoning stuff that comes later, Port Authority. We're on page 85 out of 117. So I think it's realistic to say that We've done a damn good job tonight. Review what we did already, got more information. And to bake a cake, you can't bake this big a cake in two goes. We kept postponing this. So at least, but I think it's important to bring something to the board to get the update going, right? Is, is, that, is that the sense of the committee? Okay, good. Um, and again, this will go out to everybody so you'll be able to see it. 
It'll go out either Monday or Tuesday of next week. You'll be able to see it and make comments back. Please send them to Jesse and Nellie, and then we'll send them back, you know, again, Jessica. Yeah, just uh, when we do bring it back to the board, I think uh, considering the opportunity, like we may want to offer that people that this conversation is ongoing and that people can join the public um, session of our next meeting or join as public in our next session, because I can imagine that people have comments and they can be part of the discussion as opposed to bringing it to the board and then them saying, well, why didn't you consider this, that, or the other? So since this is, we rarely have that opportunity often when people are presenting right. things, that's like the one go, um, that this is an ongoing discussion. I think it would be nice to also kind of get those comments in earlier uh, so like, and not. Like maybe do a little preamble as part of this package that's sent that says, here's what we've spent time and here's what we're doing. We have more to go. Please come to our next meeting in June. Okay. Um, so I think I have consensus on that, given that uh, everyone's been a trooper tonight and getting through this. And I hope that for our next meeting, we will put this first. Yes. If there is no need for a fire extinguisher, as Christine said, or something else that comes up in the meantime. Agreed. Is there a motion to adjourn anybody? Betty. <laughs> all right. I think, I think we're all saying <laughs> thank you all very much for coming tonight. Thank you all.